everyone, welcome back to the workshop. Today we've got a new laser in, and this is the most powerful diode we've worked with our laser so far. It is the Atom Stack Maker A30 Pro. I'm excited to jump in and see what this can do. So let's just jump right into it. All right, so here we have it. This is the Atom Stack Maker A30 Pro. This is a 33 watt diode laser and it is built on their typical frame that you've seen on their A20, their X20, and some of their even earlier versions as well. Um, but they have made sure that it's rigid enough for this beefy 33 watt dial module. Now compared to the A20, the module is close in size, it's a little bit longer, just a slightly bit bigger. Uh, so you won't see a massive size increase with that extra power here. And so you're still gonna have about the same working frame as the A20 or the X20 series. They do, of course, have the standard control box over here. It has the touchscreen offline controller. You have your TF card slot, your power buttons, reset buttons. You get your power and your USB cables. I don't like that they're sticking up on top. It's one thing I really wish they'd change. Move them onto the side uh, because they can get in the way of this emergency stop button and they're just kind of sticking up uh, right in the middle of everything here. Not a big deal, but I think I would just refine it just a little bit. On top of that, it does have limit switches uh, on both axis so that it can do its homing well. And then it has your typical uh, 28 millimeter rollers and uh, you have your eccentric nuts to make your adjustments on there as well. So if you're familiar with the Atom Stack frames, uh, you're gonna be very familiar with this one. This also comes with their really nice air pump. Uh, I'm really, was really happy with the one on the A20. I'm excited to see if this one, it looks about the same. I'm pretty sure it's gonna perform very well. And it moves a lot of air, but it's not super loud. So uh, it's fairly effective without being obnoxiously loud. I appreciate that. Uh, as far as the build went, uh, I went together in about half an hour. Now I've built a few of these, so your time may take a little bit longer. They do have a pretty good instruction manual that comes with it. And so I don't feel the need to really step through this. Uh, as far as just following those instructions, you should not have any problems. It includes all the hardware. It's really just kind of bolting a few things together. Probably the trickiest thing is just making sure that you get your belts in tight, um, but not too tight. Uh, get your eccentric nuts adjusted and then make sure that everything moves smoothly without any binding. I do appreciate they have their focus knob up front. It makes for easy adjustments. And then they do have their focus tool. The nice thing about this, is it works both directions. You can take the shroud off and then put this up on edge or with the shroud on, you just lay it down and set it right on top of there. So um, the only thing about anything like this is that uh, you can misplace this, you could lose it. So um, it might be a thing to create just a little uh, spot on here to hold that and uh, keep it with the laser at all times. And now I wanna pull you in a little bit closer here and we're gonna take a little closer look at this module. Um, so your air inlet is right on top here and this rubber hose will pop right off of there. And one thing that I'm not too big a fan on is they really do recess this connector in here. And so to pull that out, you almost have to pull on the wires or try to get something in uh, on those little tabs there. And so uh, I'd like to see it that that's a little more accessible without yanking on the wires because that's a good way to break some pins or pull some pins out of, or pull the wires out of the pins. Um, so I would really wish they didn't have it set up that way, but we'll be careful and pull that out. So as you can see here on the bottom, we do have the integrated air assist, but as you might notice, it looks like there's an outer ring and an inner ring. So I wanted to take this apart really quick and just take a look at that. Now you have two things to get at this here. You have four screws in here, if you can see them, and two of them will remove the air assist and two of them will remove this outer shroud. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the shroud first and uh, then we can take a look at the air assist. Right, so I've got the outer shroud off. Now you can see that there are just two screws holding on this air assist. So we're gonna take these out to take a look at our lens situation and how this air assist is set up. Now you can pull this air assist all the way out there. It does just plug in there, but I'm gonna hold on to that for now. But as you can see in here, they have kind of an inner cone and then this outer cone. This inner cone actually goes over this brass sleeve. And this is your, uh, you've got a cover lens in here and then your actual focus lens is up higher in here. Now the nice thing about this is that this is going to slide over there and then this air outlet comes right down to the bottom 
And if this is working the way it's designed, it should eliminate a lot of the smoke from getting up here as long as you maintain a little bit of air pressure coming out of this nozzle. Now this fan unit up here is also blowing smoke and debris down and some of that could come down here, but as you can see here, all that is gonna go in this outer cone or out the side and then it's gonna come out these sides. Again, if you have positive air pressure going there, anything that's blown through here as far as cooling because you can get some smoke that circulates re through there is not going to get into the lens area. So I really like seeing this design on here. Now, just for your information, this end cap will come off. You don't need to have it tightened on too tight. You just want it snugged up. And then in here, you have a cover lens that protects your focus lens. So you take that brass ring nut out and then you can replace that cover lens or you can purchase this whole brass sleeve. Uh, lens assembly as well. And so it's not a good idea to leave this uncovered. You want to keep as much dust out of there because this is what's protecting your actual focus lens from getting damaged. Whereas this is more of a consumable part that if it gets damaged, it's easily replaced. So as you see, we would just tighten this back down. You do want to make sure that it's on hand tight, you know, give it a good snug, but don't over tighten it. And then this is then going to slide back on there. If you were to pull this off, wondering which set of screws to put this back on, you're just gonna look for your rubber hose down here on the side for your air assist. So anyway, I just thought that was a, a cool design feature. Uh, hopefully it does uh, protect that lens a little bit longer. I'm gonna get this reassembled and we'll move ahead with the rest of this review. All right, the other things I do like is, well, I would prefer to see cable chain for cable management, uh, they do provide this kind of wire loom that everything is, and they provide a lot of anchor points on these areas for the zip ties to go into. And that's really important for providing strain relief on your wires. So as you see up here, I have a little bit of a loop onto the stepper motor and then it's secured down here. And that's gonna prevent this wire from being stretched and pulled on. And you wanna leave plenty of loop over here so that when the laser module goes to the one side, it's not getting strained. Same thing here. Use those anchor points, use those zip ties. You don't wanna pinch the air hose too much, but you can run that in there as well. But also just make sure everything is secured down and that none of the wire ends are gonna be yanked as the machine moves around. That's gonna keep your wires working longer and your machine operating without any issues for you. All right, so this machine does have your typical 400 by 400 or 400 by 410 cutting area. And that is fairly standard for most of your diode lasers. And most of it is fairly compact. You do have a stepper motor hanging off the side here, but you also need to have your wires. You do have this block up here. This uh, offline controller, you can detach if you're just gonna use it as a computer. That would save you a little space and some wires. But let's take a quick look at its overall dimensions. So front to back, we're looking at about 25 and a half just in front of this box here. And we're looking at about 22 and a quarter to clear this stepper motor here. And height wise, you would be looking at about 10 to 11 inches of height to clear the uh, gantry and your wires up here. So if you're looking at this machine, you're wondering if it's gonna fit into an enclosure, those are your bare minimums that it's just gonna squeeze into. Obviously, I would recommend you give yourself a little bit of extra room on any of the sides as well. Now, I do have it sitting on this bench uh, and I do encourage you to use an enclosure unless you're using an open space. And then I have it elevated on blocks. This is because I'm using this optional honeycomb with it. I wanted airflow underneath it. And if that was sitting in there, this is a 19 and three quarter inch honeycomb. So it gives me more access to the full cutting area, but that does kind of interfere with these wheels. So I've got the machine blocked up uh, just to clear the sides of these. All right, well, that is enough chatter about the basics of the machine. Uh, I want to get to cutting with this, getting to engraving with this. So uh, let's get some material set up there. We'll do some material tests first and see how this thing's performing. So let's get to it. So I'm running Lightburn with this. And one little tip, if you have already set up a machine in Lightburn and it is already in your devices list, uh, before you hit devices to auto detect, make sure your COM port is set to choose then hit devices, then have find my laser. When doing that, it should detect it cleanly. It should pull everything in. If it's looking on the wrong COM port, it might not find it at all. And then you'll think you'll have to add it manually. So one of the typical things I cut in my shop with my lasers is of course, three millimeter or one eighth inch Baltic birch plywood. 
Now I do have the test cut that I did on my A20. So I thought what better test to compare them and to run the same material through this machine. So I'm gonna go into Lightburn, I'm gonna set up the test file and then uh, we will run that through here. So. All right, so here we are. I pulled the card off, and as you can see, we have a fairly even gradient, except for this one weird one here. And as you can see, there's probably just something in the plywood in that spot that's keeping it from cutting through cleanly. That's uh, just something with natural material to watch out for. Now, comparing that to the A20 here, and this is the gradient I got at that one, they might look similar, but my scale is off a little bit uh, because I started the A30 at 400 millimeters a minute where this one is down at 250. So if I was to line these up, it would be more like that. And so the A30, it squeaked out, cutting out at 800 millimeters a minute at 100% power. I wouldn't recommend doing that uh, because it's, you know, if you hit any little snags in your wood, you're gonna be missing them out. But definitely in that 600 to 700 millimeters a minute range, whereas the A20 really topped out around the 450, 460 millimeters a minute range. So that's a pretty good jump up in power and speed uh, for that extra power that's coming from the laser. So that's our eighth inch material. Let's go ahead and look at some of the quarter inch or six millimeter material I've been working with as well. So that one finished and once again, we have some interesting results here. Um, it looks like right down here, if I flip this around, you'll notice there's kind of a line right there. So there's probably just some sort of imperfection, maybe a, a glue line or something in there. So what we're seeing with this one is that even at 600 millimeters a minute, um, we were still getting it cut out even in the 80% uh, percent power range, uh, definitely in the 450. Now, if we compare that to the A20, which is here, uh, we were topping out at about 500 in this same material. So 500 millimeters a minute, 100% power. In reality, I was running it at 350 to 400 millimeters per minute to get this one to cut well, whereas this one, I'm pretty sure I could run this up in the 500 to 550 millimeters a minute. So again, we're gaining another good 25% of our speed. All right, so we've cut through kind of our typical plywoods. And of course, everybody's gonna ask, what about thicker materials? So what I've got is, this is a half inch piece of Aspen. It's a fairly uh, soft, but solid wood. And then I've got your typical three quarter inch pine board. So I'm gonna run these through the laser. We'll see how well it cuts. I'm guessing this one, it's going to take a few passes, um, but you never know. We may get through this in one pass, but I want to set it up so it's elevated. We're definitely going to see when it drops and we'll see how it works. All right, so for this test, I've got the Aspen up here first. I've got it set up on these plywood rails, and so it's definitely elevated some. So once that piece does cut all the way through, we're going to see a drop. And what I've set up in Lightburn is a just one inch circle. We're going to start out at 150 millimeters a minute and 100% power. So I'm going to try to have it cut roughly half the circle uh, and leave the other half. That way we can tell if it's cutting through. No. All right, so, <clears throat> so for this test, I've got the wood set up on the rails. I've drawn a one inch circle. I've got the power set at 150 and 100. We're gonna get this lined up and we'll have it cut. Once it does cut all the way through, it should drop all the way out. So we should clearly see that. So uh, it may have to run a few tests, but I'm gonna try to do this in real time. And so you'll see the actual performance. There you are. It's actually a pretty clean cut. I don't know that we could go any faster. 
Matter of fact, it's just barely caramelized there. A little darker on a couple sides. Um, and then um, there is a little, there is a little charring on the back side there. So possibly something in the wood. I'm gonna try this again. I'm gonna bump it up to uh, 200. Let's see if it does just as well. All right, 24 seconds, that cut through cleanly as well. Looking just as good. So let's just keep pushing it a little higher. Let's, uh, let's jump this all the way up to 300. All right, that time it did not drop, but let's see. Yeah, just the top and the bottom. So 300 was no good, 200 is good. Maybe 250 is our middle point. Um, but either way, a single pass, cutting through half inch uh, aspen, it's very similar to basswood. Uh, pretty impressive. All right, I switched over to the pine. We're gonna refocus this. Down like that. And what I'm gonna do is actually, now that it's focused, I'm gonna bring this down just a touch more. That's gonna lower the focal point deeper into the wood, but still give us some airflow there so i just have a slight gap and with this one i'm starting out at 125 speed 125 millimeters a minute 100 percent power i'm guessing this isn't going to go through in one shot but let's try it and then uh, if it doesn't we'll run it a second time so here we go didn't drop. So I'm going to go ahead and run it a second pass. Now I'm seeing more, more light through this. This should be more successful. Oh, looks like it dropped. All right. So yeah, as you can see there, definitely we're getting some charring. It did get through but it was not very clean. Now, let me try actually speeding this up and adding some passes to the file. That'll make the laser linger in one spot less. Might actually give us a cleaner cut. So I'm gonna turn this around. We'll reframe this. I'll set this back up. Didn't quite get through, but it's really close. So I'm gonna run ahead. So this would be pass number seven. Eight. 30 off. Need about eight passes. But as you can see, the front side and the back side, a lot cleaner. All right, so we've tested a lot of cutting and it has performed pretty well at that. Uh, but the concern is as you go up in power and maybe you get a larger focus dot, uh, does the engraving suffer? So I'm gonna run a test grid. We're gonna do it on some three millimeter Baltic birch first. Uh, try to get our uh, numbers first as far as our speed and power range. And then we'll throw a photo at this and see how it comes out. So. All right, so the test completed and we have a pretty good gradient here. Once again, I did increase through light burn in the console. I increased the travel, maximum travel speed of X and Y to 10,000 millimeters a minute to achieve this. And as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna be looking at nine to 10,000 millimeters a minute. As a matter of fact, 10,000 looks a little more even, just barely getting some coloration down at the 10% and we're not getting any extra overburn up at 100%. So. Uh, I'll probably actually set my photos uh, to be about 10 to 90% power and we'll go from there. So.
as you can see there, it still has uh, plenty of ability to do a photorealistic engraving. Now I could tweak these settings a little bit more, I think, and get just a little more clarity and contrast. But for a first run at just taking our grid and uh, throwing a photo at it, uh, I'm actually fairly, fairly pleased with this. Again, so. This was run at 10,000 millimeters a minute, and I did have it topping out at 90% power. And that took about 35 minutes to finish this. This is roughly four and three quarters inches wide and uh, about uh, three and a half inches tall. So. so I am gonna cut this one there. I wanted to focus this video just on its sheer cutting capabilities, yet how well it can still engrave. And uh, we did see a pretty significant increase over the A20 uh, as far as its speed, as well as I feel in its capacity to be able to cut three quarter inch pine softwood as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it informational. And I hope if you are looking into upgrading into a 30 plus watt laser, that this helped you out in your decision making. If you have any questions or comments about that, go ahead and leave them down below. I do read through those and try to get back to them in a timely manner. I will have more information about this laser and links to where you can purchase it down below. So check the description for that, as well as other items that I find useful in my shop when working with dialed lasers. Some of these links will be affiliate links. They do go to support me, but at no extra cost to you. So I appreciate when you use them, but it's always no pressure. Before I go, I want to remind you of uh, the Sunday night live streams that I do with David from the Clock Shack. We do them Sunday nights, 7 p.m. Central Time. We hop on live, we talk about what's going on in our workshops, we talk about new products that are coming out, and we, most of all, we enjoy answering the questions from the audience. So if you would like to come and hang out with us live, ask us questions, see what's going on, and just join the community, check out links below. I will have that. It is always a good time, and we look forward to seeing you there. In the meantime, I thank you for stopping by and checking out this video. There will be more coming very soon. So if you haven't already, consider subscribing hit that like button, do all the things. It definitely helps this channel and helps me out. So I appreciate every time you do that, but I really hope that you can get out in your workshop and make something too, and we will catch you next time.